Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today at the 2020 LD4 Conference on Linked Data and Libraries. My name is Eric Radio, and I'll be moderating uh, the infrastructure track today. Uh, before we get started, just to uh, call your attention to a few links. The conference schedule is listed right there, um, the conference site as well, as well as the Twitter handle and the hashtag if you'd like to interact with the conference in that way. There's also a dedicated Slack channel um, for this particular track, LD4 2020 infrastructure track. And then finally, there are community participation guidelines that I encourage you to check out when you have a moment. Um, so to that end, I'd like to hand things over to Matt Miller from Library of Congress, who'll be talking about the Library of Congress Bib Frame Editor experience. All right, can you hear me? Um, so I am going to be presenting today on the Library of Congress Bib Frame Editor experience. Uh, Matt Miller, I work at the Library of Congress in the uh, Network Development and Mark Sanders office. Um, I mostly work on uh, our BitFrame initiative there, and I also support things like id.loc.gov and other things like that. Um, I'm presenting to you from outside of the uh, Adams building in DC, um, been described as a handsome box because it contains millions of, of resources, but also contains me. I'm usually up here in the right hand side corner. Um, this is a fairly old picture. Uh, but I assume it's still there. I haven't seen it for a few months. Um, all right, so I'm going to get started and share my screen. Okay, so if you uh, want to follow along, uh, at the bottom left there is a bit.ly link for this presentation. So it's just a Google slide deck, so you can open it up and um, follow along if you like. Um, but today I'm mostly going to be talking about um, this new project that's we started in our in our office around refactoring the BitFrame editor. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what the BitFrame editor is, uh, what it currently is, what we're, our goals of, of it are going to be kind of heading towards. Um, we're going to look at the process that have gotten us to this point and then kind of some future steps that we're going to take and, and what it looks like. And we also have some deliverables for you if you're interested in um, some wireframes and mockups of the current uh, 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 redesign it and what, what those look like. So to kind of get started, I'm just going to describe what the BibFrame editor is. Um, it's a piece of, uh, it's a very important piece of our BibFrame pilot, which is a pilot to um, start cataloging at the Library of Congress in BibFrame, the BibFrame standard um, to get away from using uh, Mark. And the BibFrame editor is the kind of central piece um, that allows catalogers to do this editing of these records in BibFrame in native RDF. Um, so in our kind of current setup now, this is a very kind of simplified diagram, but we have our, our traditional ILS, our Voyager system, that um, feeds into our BibFrame database, which is a MARC XML um, database, and converts those MARC records over into BibFrame records. And then that, the, that can interact with this BibFrame editor. And the BitFrame editor is a, is a web-based app um, that allows you to edit these records that can, you can create new records from scratch or edit existing records that have been converted. And um, to support the BitFrame editor is also a profile editor. Um, so the profile editor are basically creates profiles that are kind of like roadmaps for you know, mapping fields to specific RDF properties uh, to help create the record. And then of course we have id.lc.gov, which hosts all of our um, lookups and a lot of um, our kind of controlled vocabularies and things like that. So the existing editor has been around for a few years. Um, it, it's, uh, it's been very useful in kind of our process of, of developing and working on this pilot. Um, it was created by Kevin uh, Ford a few years back. Um, and uh, if you want some more information about the history of this current editor, you can check out this link at the bottom where he did a presentation about it. Um, but over the last few years, it's been maintained um, by Kirk and Jody. Um, and it's really been like, kind of like a platform for uh, developing the pilot and developing um, different aspects of the pilot. So from a technological point of view, there's like two sides of this development cycle. There's changes to the profiles, which allow for um, you know, different materials to be cataloged. And then there's also changes to the editor itself to allow um, new features to be done um, in, the, in the editor. Um, so this has been a really good platform. Um, Jody's kind of like the genius behind uh, updating the profiles and trying out new profiles and working with um, groups to, to get the profiles working how they wanted them. And then, you know, if we come across a new, a new feature that we want to support, something like, you know, 
uh, cataloging uh, different uh, scripts in different languages better. We go through this process of you know working on the editor, adding new features, and having that um, support the the output of the BibFrame records. So it's been a very um, useful kind of platform and tool um, along the years to um, push this pilot forward. I just want to quickly kind of show um, what the current editor looks like, just to give you an idea of what what it what it means if you haven't seen it before. Um, so if you go to bitframe.org, you can see the current editor and the profile editor. Um, so we're just going to look at the, the current editor. And so um, you know it has some uh, features to control records and, and that sort of thing. But then you can also create um, resources based on these profiles I've been talking about. So if you go in and create a new monographic work, this is basically what the interface looks like. You come into um, these modals and you add different uh, pieces of data. And you can kind of think of uh, this of each window as kind of like its own resource. And you know you can use lookups uh, to add things in. I'll just add a title. Um, and so this is kind of like uh, the basic steps of using the editor and going through it. And of course, this ends up in uh, BibFrame RDF uh, that can be uh, exported and sent over to the, the BibFrame database. Um, so it's kind of rare that you would be, um, maybe not too rare, but you usually when folks wouldn't be creating a, a record from scratch, um, it's also connected to the BibFrame database that you can import a record and start editing it. Um, but this is kind of like the basic um, look of the current editor. Um, you know, Kevin often mentions it was designed to be kind of like a general RDF editor. Um, so it could, you know, you can use, you could use any vocabulary or really kind of like uh, structure your records however you want them. It's not really designed, it wasn't designed specifically to be just a bit frame editor. So um, that brings us to um, some reasons why we want to refactor. And so the main reason is that, um, uh, you probably heard, heard mention in this, the, the BibFrame to Mark um, workflow that allows you to convert a BibFrame record to a Mark record, and you'd want to do that because you could put it back into a traditional ILS. Um, and this is really important for us at LC because it would um, reduce double keying, right? So currently, the pilot participants have to double key records um, when they're creating uh, uh, a, a new record um, in their workflow. Um, so this would um, you know, we want to support that moving towards that goal of being able to only key once in uh, editor and then that editor can output you know or the process can output that as mark if needed um, and so with this kind of shift towards this goal and we have an additional um, increased number of pilot participants you know, uh, you know up to as much as 100 folks uh, could be working on it um, we wanted to kind of shift the editor from um, kind of like a platform for experimentation and, and editing uh, to kind of more of like a, a little bit more production geared, right? And so a big part of that is making the editor um, nice uh, for the people who use it and for the users involved. And so what we wanted to do is is refactor the editor. So, you know, maintain the current functionality of it, but do something in a way that makes the editor a better experience for the people who have to work in it um, with these kind of goals backing up why we'd want to go towards that that route. Um, so the process was uh, we wanted to kind of, uh, before we started building anything, uh, we know that we could do this tech part, right? So we have the current editor, it works uh, fine for our, our processes and, and our, our pilot. Um, so we know we could do that part, but we wanted to focus on this user interface and the experience of that. Um, so we contracted um, Samhang, who is a um, UX consulting uh, firm uh, to help us along this process. Uh, they um, have worked on other kind of bibliographic re related uh, projects before, like Folio and you know, Share BDE and things like that. So they're not, they're familiar with this domain uh, somewhat. So it's not like a, a completely external group that doesn't know any of this um, bibliographic kind of data. And so these uh, are co these contractors um, met with um, BigFrame pilot participants over several months and worked on a new design with them. And so this was a totally um, LC cataloger driven process. Um, the folks on the right hand side here are the um, LC pilot participants who worked mostly with the, uh, the process and the consultants working on this. And us in um, NetDev, we really 
removed ourselves from the the, the UX kind of consulting process. Um, we didn't even want to, you know, be in the room while they're talking about what they did like or didn't like, because um, it's very easy to kind of like in, in, inject yourself in the conversation and say like, well, actually, if you do this, this, right? And so we wanted to be totally kind of purely from reflexive of uh, the catalogers, what they found useful and what they didn't like um, about the current editor, and then kind of like more blue skying, like, you know, what could a, a different editor look like from their perspective and what would really be useful for them uh, to make their job easier and to make the bib frame pilot uh, smoother. Um, so again, these folks on the, on the right are really to, to the credit of, of this process. Um, so the deliverables from this process, you know, over many months um, were basically some wireframes. And so uh, these wireframes um, compose of uh, the nitty gritty kind of details of uh, each field and what these different styles of the field should look like. It also had larger kind of um, uh, workflow suggestions, right? So, you know, what does a, what does a uh, My Records page look like, for example, you know, I want to browse for this or I want to look for that. Um, but a big part of it was, you know, the actual editor interface itself. So how do we go from the old editor um, and into something more kind of geared towards what the catalogers preferred? Um, so there's um, these wireframes, uh, feature suggestions, um, and style guides were delivered to us. Um, so kind of like if you wanted to summarize or sum up this kind of a large goal of this kind of redesign it would be to kind of like flatten and unnest the display a little bit um, to make it just more clear, right? So um, you could see the, the previous editor, uh, you have to have some really kind of understanding of what's going on to kind of figure out what's happening. And so this new, we wanted the new display to kind of be editor to be kind of very kind of transparent about what data is there, what that data looks like um, to the end user and all those steps in between. Um, and we also wanted to spend a lot of time on um, more friendly kind of navigation or more accessible uh, interface. And so that prim primarily means everything you can do um, in the app should be able to be done by just the keyboard alone. So any kind of major uh, core functionality should be accomplished just by using the keyboard um, without having to pause and click and move around and all those sorts of things. Um, so really kind of a focus on uh, the experience. Um, so we have these wireframe materials available to anyone if they want to come and take a look at them. Um, if you go to the site, they have, um, uh, it'll look like something like this. It's, it comes, it's high fidelity interfaces, uh, but here's the site. And then we have um, these high level walkthroughs of the, of the interface. Um, we have a, a video from the consultant, uh, Philip, who uh, kind of described in detail the process. And we have some design details. So this could be useful to you if you're thinking about bibliographic interfaces or perspectives of catalogers on user experience, all those sorts of good stuff um, if you want to take a look. All right. And so uh, to kind of usher this, set, this process along, once we had these wireframes back, uh, we needed to kind of test these assumptions that were uh, kind of laid out in the design process and what they look like, right? And so the idea was we'll build a proof of concept, which is not a full editor, but really kind of focuses on these specific UI interactions just to show um, a number of things, right? To show that these assumptions were, were correct and this is what um, folks really want. Um, the test, you know, technologically feasible, you know, do we have uh, someone who can make this? You know, am I able to code this up? Um, all these kind of things wanted to kind of test before we really spent um, a huge amount of time saying like, this is the next thing, right? Um, so we're currently at the step where we're evaluating uh, this, we're building this proof of concept and we're gonna evaluate it. So I can just show you where that proof of concept is now. We're getting close to start beginning the evaluation process. Um, but basically, again, the, the main goal of this was to um, test these UI assumptions. And so things like workflows of like, you know, locating a record or those sorts of things, those are kind of not as high up as like these kind of like nitty gritty things as far as like, okay, what does it look like to add an authority? What does it look like to edit something, right? And so this proof of concept um, is running and it's basically um, 
everything is, like I mentioned, can be controlled by the keyboard, right? So I'm used to using the up and down arrows to navigate between fields. Um, if you want to add um, a authority, for example, this is the, the authority interface. Um, so it's loading um, data from id.lc.gov. And these are different types of authorities, right? There's a personal name, here's a title, here's a corporate name. And of course, you can filter these into what you want. Um, let's look at a more complete record. And on the right-hand side, you know, you can see if this is actually the correct authority that you, you want to, to use in your record, uh, and then you can add it to your record. And so everything is, is you know, keyboard-based. So if I, I just add one, one author, say I want to add another contributor, you know, you can just easily add a new field and add a new um, record for them. Right. And so um, another thing is that we wanted the, the interface to be very clear about where the data, is, what the data looks like, right? Um, and so nothing's kind of like hiding behind somewhere. It's all kind of very flat and in the open. And if you notice like on the left-hand side here, the idea of this is the car there's gonna be kind of like a checklist, right? And so you can kind of see as you're going through and adding fields or filling out fields, you've got like a check mark. And the idea is like, you could kind of quickly look at this um, left-hand side menu and say, uh, okay, I filled everything out that I wanted to fill out or needed to fill out. And you can, you know, if you see something missing without a check mark, you can go and investigate that. And then on the, in the middle here, right, we, we know we're editing a specific field and this specific property. And then on the right-hand side also highlighted is what that's gonna look like kind of to a, a end user, right? And so this was a feature that was requested is like, how is this, how is this record gonna look like in say an OPAC, for example? Um, and that's really kind of difficult to do because there isn't a lot of um, kind of, there isn't really an OPAC for big frame records yet, right? There isn't, it's not really like, you know what an OPAC looks like for MARC records, um, it, they're ubiquitous, right? But like, what is this gonna look like for, for an kind of OPAC-ish interface? But it was important to kind of like give some semblance of that, right? This could look like something like this. You don't have all these different pieces hanging off there. You just say like, okay, this this looks right. Um, so you know, you can everything is is pretty kind of self-explanatory. Uh, titles, literals, um, etc. Right. And so this is um, basically the, the core of the editor. Um, uh, going through and 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 having this being able to kind of load arbitrary profiles and having these user interactions working correctly um, are kind of like a major po component of, of getting to the next step. Um, so the next the next process, as I mentioned, will be kind of testing this with um, the folks who designed it, right? So the, the, the pilot participants who spent time uh, dreaming up this interface and seeing how it compares to their expectations. And then also, you know, more more kind of user tests and saying like, yes, this is a good interface for cataloging or no, I we need something else or things need to be different. Um, so there are some more advanced features and, you know, it's, we don't, these are feature suggestions that don't exist currently. Um, you know, the idea of editing a field, adding an authority record, those are already kind of pre-existing functionality in the current editor. Um, but there were suggestions to having some other features, more advanced features that don't currently exist um, that would be make people's lives easier. Um, and so we're not sure about the feasibility of some of these. Um, they're all technically feasible. Um, but it's a question of you know uh, how much effort we want to put into it. But some of them like on the right hand side are, are really kind of interesting and it's kind of it's kind of interesting to, to think about um, these other features that you could you would maybe want to have in a, in a bibliographic editor. And so one of them is um, this change log feature, right? So being able to track changes over time to a record, um, as far as, you know, this, this person edited this field, or, you know, these three fields were removed, et cetera. So kind of like a git change log for a bit frame record. And so that introduces a whole host of like, you know, technologically complicated ideas of like, well, would you store that metadata of the changing in the admin info of a big frame record that seems kind of difficult um so you know it opens the question like would there could there be kind of well how would these records be stored would they just be versioned etc right but 
but being able to switch between what change over time is an interesting concept from a, a bibliographic point of view for a record. Um, other features are more kind of geared towards accessibility and customization, right? So things like setting color schemes for different um, situations, different preferences, uh, things like changing fonts, uh, you know, of course, font sizes and um, faces uh, to be work better for specific individuals. And then this idea of templates, which kind of exists currently in the current Bitform editor, but not um, fully fleshed out as envisioned here, where you could kind of like create a template that would just be, you know, part of your workflow, right? So if you're if you're working on a, a large number of materials that always have the same field populated with this value, you should go in and create a template and just pick up and you know you wouldn't have to re refill all that information. You could really customize how you want your, your profile to look for that specific workflow. So these are some kind of advanced features that um, are on the table and, and discussing. Um, so and lastly, I was gonna talk a little bit about the technology. Um, so the current editor, the Bitform editor, was just a, a jQuery uh, application, client-side application. Um, and so jQuery is very easy to kind of get into. Um, it's very simple to, to figure out what's going on and, and, and update stuff and deploy it. Um, it has a Node.js backend um, with a, a very simple kind of memory JSON file store. And so uh, my main point about this slide is I wanted to think about how can we keep things as simple as this or try to keep things simple as far as maintaining or developing it, right? Um, so like RDF is extremely complicated to work with. So we don't wanna pile on a lot of technical kind of layers that make it even more hard to work with. Um, and so, you know, those are kind of just choices um, that can, uh, made, can be made during the development process. So for example, you know, everything are triples but everything is still record based right all, all of our workflow is very very much record based um you know there's not just one giant triple store full of all the information and we kind of assemble this magically out of the air everything has a record and and these, these statements are attached to those records you know th that's from kind of like a conceptual point but to the, a more practical point is that you know reviewing the the landscape of tools available you know it, it seems that certain frameworks are more developer friendly right and so something like we're using for this project, we're using Vue.js as opposed to the ubiquitous React um, framework, because you know there's just been kind of like a, a more kind of, I've seen a lot of feedback about Vue.js just being a little bit kinder to um, for the developers, um, because we want to be able just to um, be supported by, you know, not just one person or be able to, you know, easily get into and figure out what's happening and then changing and updating it. And then finally, you know, the back end is going to be a document store um, and it would be nice to kind of like pile this stuff into a single container so we could do things like, you know, have a single application that you could export, you know, a mark record from, right? Because our we could put our current big frame to mark uh, and other serializations into that, into that stack as well. So I think that's about all I have to, to talk about. Um, uh, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to reach out to me at these um, addresses and also there's the link to the uh, presentation again. So I think we have plenty of time to have some questions. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to, to answer them. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. That was great. Um, we have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, first one is, when you receive feedback from catalogers, were these done in the form of UX diaries or a feedback form of some kind? And then what is the percentage of catalogers who offer feedback as you deploy these UX changes to the editor? So um, the, the process that the consultants went through, uh, it was kind of like a group uh, session. They, they would meet, you know, once a week for, you know, a couple hours and they would go through processes and they would go through activities, you know, let's create a monographic work and how does that look? And what do you like about it? What don't you like about it? Um, so that was the, the process of developing the wireframes. We haven't yet deployed these changes to the wider uh, group or made them available to the wider group. We're going to start doing that uh, in the next few weeks um, with the, the initial pilot group, or that's the plan at least. Great. Um, the next question is, the OPAC view is great. What ideas do you have for showing how linked data is improving the patron's ability to find and understand things? Current OPAC preview is similar to a mark-based OPAC view. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I mean, um, the OPAC view idea that was proposed by the pilot participants was really based on, you know, you can fill out a form 
but you don't really know what it's going to look like on the other, at the other end, right? And so I think for this specific OPAC um, view that's in the editor, it was just kind of like a gut check, you know, to say like, oh, I put the name in and that's what it's going to look like uh, probably at some point when it gets to the OPAC. Um, so I don't know, um, you know, some of these kind of like enrichments, maybe like linking out to different things and displaying additional uh -huh. metadata wouldn't necessarily be available in this kind of like OPAC view. Um, but yeah, that could be something to think about um, to, to kind of uh, represent this data differently than just, you know, a mark record. Great. Are there any other questions for Matt? Okay, one more, a couple more coming in. Um, are you planning to incorporate formatting guidance for uncontrolled and partially controlled field values or rely on users accessing external sources such as the RDA toolkit or local application profiles? Yeah, so th that wasn't demonstrated yet, but there, sh there will be an ability to add an uncontrolled uh, name or uncontrolled you know, uh, value to the, to the, to the record. Um, exactly how that will look, I'm not sure. Before we had a very elaborate kind of RDA field layout that you could go through and fill out everything to actually create that record in the editor. Um, I think we're, we're more relying on um, authority lookups um, to try to move towards that direction. Um, but, you know, of course, there's other kind of things that are, um, you know, things like uh, subject headings, precurrent subject headings, all these kind of like uh, nuanced things that the editor still have to be worked on to kind of make it a better experience. Great. Uh, next question is, you mentioned that you're still storing records. How are you able to do this in a graph database? Right. So, so we aren't doing it in a graph database, if that's the question. I mean, the, uh, if you're familiar with MarkLogic, it has like a, tr a triple store capability and you can store triples in there uh, and you can store triples in your documents. So it, you, you can still run Sparkle queries across the documents as a Sparkle query. But for the editor itself, it's, it's, it's purely a JSON document store. So it's stored as JSON LD. Um, and you know, the, the, you have to think about like, you know, if we want to start supporting some of these more advanced features like, you know, um, change logs and stuff like that. Could that really just be stored as JSON LD, or would we need to kind of like have uh, you know a different kind of of a backend record, but it still be JSON um, LD? So it's still stored as JSON LD. It's just very record based, and we don't um, use a graph uh, database for the editor backend. Great, thanks. Uh, another one about the change log is: Can the actual fields be ch changed? Be specified? Ah, excuse me. Can the actual fields change be specified as well, not just the number? Yeah, I think it's like a full kind of um, state change, right? So even if you change one field um, and then committed that change, you'd be able to see like, oh, you changed the, the you know, this specific uh, verbiage to something else. Um, and so techno technologically, this is very feasible with the current kind of proof of concept we have here because modern development is our web frame network uh, sorry, JavaScript frameworks um, use a state management. So you could theoretically track the state management and, and save off a little version of that every time something changes. Um, the question is just at what degree do you want to support that? Do you want to support it all the way down to individual field value change or um, a larger kind of picture? Um, so right now, if we do implement that feature, it would be everything but only at certain intervals, right? Only when um, the cataloger hits commit to say like, okay, I'm done changing this record, uh, would we kind of take a snapshot of it? Okay, the next question is, is there an ability to enter URIs or IRIs rather than text strings in the editor? Um, so we were, we're, we're kind of gearing towards more of a, a streamlined approach. So most um, of these workflows are very defined already. So, you know, they might, um, the folks working on a resource might do the authority work the first day and the next day come back and look up stuff. Um, so I think there's, it's, it'd be very simple to add additional lookups um, and it'd be pretty trivial to add just a, a URI input. Um, but in the kind of uh, goal of having things a little bit more streamlined and easy to use, if, if say we wanted to support Wikidata lookups, right? We, I would go in and add the Wikidata lookup profile to the, to the current application, to the application. Um, and then that would just, that would be one of the options at the top, right? You, do you want NAF? Do you want LCSH? Do you want Wikidata? And you just look it up. Um, but so, cause the, theoretically you could add just a kind of URI 
um, but we also wanted to make sure there's a context, like on the right hand side, there's a context pane showing you exactly what you're about to add. So because of that, you kind of have to know what resources are, are being used, um, but you can you could add any system that you wanted to this, to this lookup process. Great. Uh, one question is, uh, one thing that uh, I've wondered about for these editors is why they are browser-based as opposed to something like Electron, which I expect would help alleviate browser compatibility problems. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so this, um, this is, uh, was planned to be an Electron application. Um, and so, I mean, Electron applications are basically, they are web pages. They're just packaged into a, a native app. Um, so that does open up some new possibilities of, of keyboard commands, stuff like that. And you're kind of outside of the realm of, you know, being strictly limited to, to certain key combinations. Um, so that's a very good question. I did not mention that, that the goal would be to kind of package this up as an, as an electron app um, to, be, to be distributed. Great, uh, I've got two more questions for you. Um, are there any plans to allow scholars to contribute cataloging insights rather than strictly library catalogers with these tools? Hmm, yeah. I don't know. So this interface is definitely no, right? This is not an interface for um, kind of the casual kind of um, contributor. Uh, but, you know, I think there's other opportunities for that, um, especially around linking of authority files to other resources. Um, so, you know, id.lsu.gov is now um, hooked up to, to 1.2 million Wikidata entries. So that sort of contributions can be made in, in those kind of platforms that support that contribution and then reused in the bibliographic world. Um, so, you know, I think that might be a more kind of productive way forward with that goal rather than having someone using this interface, um, which is really kind of focused on a cataloger workflow. Okay, and then I believe our last question is, can any individual or smaller institution download BibFrame Editor and play with it? What's the process to download? And is there just a demo version? And is there any, any limitations on that? Uh, the, the current editor that I demoed first in the very beginning, that's available at bibframe.org. You can download it and run it today. It's, it's um, a Node.js app, so you need a little bit of know-how to get it running, but there's no limitations. It's open source. This current editor that, you know, is on um, its process to continue to be developed and then, you know, released is also an open source project. Um, it will be available. It's already up on GitHub. Um, you can, of course, download it and use it as well. There's no limitations. Great. Well, if there are no other questions, I'd like to thank Matt for this uh, very interesting presentation and uh, his contact information is there if uh, something comes to mind. I'll also point you to the Slack infrastructure channel uh, for further discussion on this topic in the coming days. So thank you again, Matt. Great. Thanks. Bye.